Regret. We all got it. Even the people making cartoons. These are five cartoonists who hated their work or the experience around it. I know more than five, but this video is long enough. It's juice and jam time. You know what I think of that? There. Yeah. Play the guitar on the MTV. That ain't working. That's the way you do it. Money for nothing and it's just free. Along the milestones of CG animation history, the 1985 music video for Dire Straits Money for Nothing was the first to feature animated CGI human characters. No doubt this was world changing for animation and the two animators, Ian Person and Gavin Blair would be regarded within the industry as those guys who did the Money for Nothing video. That's all the two were known for. They were so annoyed by that one claim to fame, they mocked it in their future work on a cartoon series they created 10 years later called Reboot. It follows a group of programs defending a world inside a computer from malicious software. In one episode that hosted a talent show, somebody special auditioned. And now, the dire Sal and Hart. Is it just me, Em, or are these acts getting worse? That was oddly brutal. It's safe to say the two animators and the animation studio they founded, Rainmaker Entertainment, have went on to make tons of recognizable works including the Ratchet and Clank film, Transformers Beast Wars, Scary Godmother, all those Barbie and Hot Wheel movies, and their magnum opus, Tony Hawk's Boom Boom Sabotage. I said recognizable works, I didn't say good. Let me just say my YouTube channel is partnered with Fred Raider Animation, which has just been bought out by Rainmaker as I write this script. So these guys now own both Fred Raider and my ass. Give me my bow! Well, if you can't be nicer than that, I guess you'll never see your dumb old ball again. If you grew up in the 90s and are now a sad, bitter adult, you must still love the Rugrats, but may have hated Angelica, the bully of the show. You're not alone on that last part, as some crew members would agree with the Angelica hate. This spoiled three-year-old caused a divide between the writers and co-creator Arlene Klasky. Arlene felt Angelica was just too mean-spirited, while the writers disagreed when producing episodes. As for what went into the finished product, often the writers would get their way. Within the show, the parents to the Rugrats would read research books on how to raise kids written by fictional child psychologist Dr. Lipschitz. Lipschitz was overly critical on any parents who didn't live up to his high personal standards. Secretly on the inside, this was created as a way for the writers to make fun of Arlene's specifications on how babies and Angelica should behave. Here's your bib, Chucky. Careful! I'm sure you realize that tying the bib is a highly symbolic act. If you tie it too tightly, you deprive the child of his emotional freedom. Oh, my. Tie it too loosely, and you deny him the firmness of your love. Yikes. Either way, the damage could be irreparable. <laughs> Now, for another Rugrats story of self-hatred, this one does not involve the show itself, but the fans around it. Have you ever clicked on an article that says, Check out these beloved cartoon characters drawn as adults with art we stole? Well, former storyboard artist Eric Malinsky was tired of all those pieces of Rugrats fan art portraying them as perfect, skinny, hipster, supermodel, forever 21, Starbucks drinking, internet startup, 20-something, Tinder, Tumblr, Uber driver, Instagram, Arizona green tea, waist high, jean shorts, hashtag sale. Sailor Moon pastel goth iPhone case versions of the Rugrats. Whew. In a blog post, Eric wrote the following, which I shortened for this video. No, the Rugrats did not all grow up to be fashion models or self-confident hipsters, especially not Chucky. Jeez, man, what do you got against Chucky? My best guess, the Rugrats would look something like this. <laughs> In hindsight, Eric apologized for how arrogant he came across and learned to respect fan interpretations. He just didn't like how glamorous the fan art came across when the style of the Rugrats was in perfection. Which I understand, though I would not go on a rant like this. 
In another Rugrat story, this does not involve a cartoonist, but the actor Bruce Willis, who did the voice of the pet dog Spike in the movie Rugrats Go Wild. It's less explicit than the title makes it sound. I'm not for certain he did hate working on this, but I just wanted to bring up this one interview Bruce did for America Online. Al wants to know, what was it like portraying a dog? Um, it's pretty similar to real life. It, uh, it, it, it you know, the character of, of the character of Spike is a, uh, you know, pretty easygoing dog. Uh, leads a dog's life. Um, has a lot of fun. You know, doesn't take a lot of things that seriously. Uh, gets a pretty big kick out of life. Um, Bruce Willis was deader in that interview than he was in Sixth Sense. Coming up next, the Flintstones meet the Jetsons. Uh-oh, I smell another cheap cartoon crossover. Bart Simpson, meet Jay Sherman the Critic. With a long history of episodes, The Simpsons has made a few regrettable choices, like when the crew wasn't fond of the early season's crude animation style done by Klasky Chupo Studios, so they switched over to Film Roman. But that crude style didn't stop it from being a cultural icon inspiring other primetime animated sitcoms, such as the short-lived but fondly remembered The Critic. It was mistreated and cancelled by by the channel ABC, then moved to Fox, and then cancelled again. As a form of promotion pre-cancellation, Fox demanded The Simpsons do a crossover with the critic in the episode, A Star is Burns. The episode in which the movie critic Jay Sherman from The Critic hosts a film festival in Springfield. Hans Mole Man Productions presents Man Getting Hit by Football. <laughs> Simpsons creator Matt Groening from the beginning wanted nothing to do with this, a crossover he felt would ruin the world building the show established and be out of place. Before the episode was finished, Matt openly expressed hatred to any press and Fox executives he could, in hopes the episode would get canned. While members of the Simpsons and critic crew felt Matt was going too far, once the crossover episode aired, Matt had his name removed from the credits and refused to show up on the DVD audio commentary. As for me, I was not aware of the critic until long after I saw this episode, so it was funny on its own and never felt like an advertisement. Because The Simpsons went on to make more crossover episodes with Family Guy, Futurama, and The X-Files, it's safe to assume Matt has lightened up to the idea of crossovers as Jay Sherman continues to cameo in later episodes. Goodbye, Mr. Sherman. If I ever play Carnegie Hall, I'll give you a call. And if you ever want to visit my show... Nah, we're not gonna be doing that. That was a big ordeal, but I'm not done with The Simpsons yet. Let's fast forward to Season 9, the tipping point where a lot of Simpsons fans refer to as the final good season. In the episode Principal and the Popper, it turns out Principal Skinner was actually an imposter named Armin Tamzarian, living the life of the real Seymour Skinner, thought to be dead in Vietnam. I have never been happier or prouder to be Seymour Skinner. You're not Seymour Skinner. Skinner! Skinner? I'm Skinner. Seymour? i Mother! She's my mother! Fans were confused and insulted that Skinner lived this lie, which I didn't really get. We only knew this Skinner, the only change now is he's got a new name. I recommend listening to the audio commentary. The writers claim this was the biggest backlash they've ever received and spent half the time trying to rationalize why people were so angry over a character who wasn't all that popular. <laughs> now that we've gotten that out of the way. For God's sakes, first of all, light up! Light up, Jesus America. Christ! Let us try something different Holy without crap. one episode out of what? Five million? We can't try something different? Whatever, okay, fine. This was something of a controversial episode. Writer Kim Keeler feels this was his best work as creator Matt Groening and the voice of Seymour thought it was a stupid gimmicky twist. On the season 9 DVD introduction, Matt briefly mentions his thoughts. We discover Principal Skinner isn't who he says he is in one of my least favorite episodes. And in a season 15 episode where Lisa kept killing and replacing her cats, each named Snowball followed by a number, we see it brought up again. You're Snowball 5. But to save money on a new dish, we'll just call you Snowball 2 and pretend this whole thing never happened. That's really a cheat, isn't it? I guess you're right, Principal Tamzarian. I'll just be moving along, Lisa. I think that sums up everybody's reaction. How do you prepare for the biggest post-game party of the year? <laughs> the Simpsons Super Bowl Spectacular coming up next on Fox. Hey, 
Why did they want to make Spike speak? Uh, I think it. I think it. Uh, it was a. It was a. F it came about because of the. The original concept of. Uh, Bendy. I've talked about this in 2012, and we're still here talking about Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, the show about a foster home for imaginary friends. In the episode, Everyone Knows It's Bendy, this new imaginary friend, Bendy, is put up for adoption. He seems like a nice guy. What the heck was that all about? Oh, damn it. The little Dr. Seuss Pikachu repeatedly smashes stuff, throws a tantrum, and frames others for his actions. The authority figures running the home believe the new guy over the imaginary friends who've lived there way longer. By the end of the episode, Bendy gets off scot-free while the main characters take the blame. What the fuck? The writer, Lauren Faust, has long regretted this episode and offers an explanation as to why this episode came out as it did. Early Foster episodes were 30 minutes long, but later ones were split to 15 minutes. The story was heavily condensed, and Lauren wanted to get the whole Foster gang in the situation of being framed. In retrospect, she feels it just being Blue, the troublemaker getting framed, would have made far more sense. He's totally framing me! You gotta believe me! Guys, you gotta back me up! That was bad, but oh no, we got another episode by Lauren Faust in the Powerpuff Girls episode, Equal Fights. A female supervillain shows up doing evil, but it's okay. She went through more bad things in life as an abused woman, and that justifies her bad behavior, apparently. Come on, girls. Think about what you're doing. Sending me to jail will be a blow for all of womankind including you. The young, impressionable girls fall for it until they get arrested about equality. Susan B. Anthony didn't want special treatment. She wanted to be treated equally. She demanded that she be sent to jail just like any man who broke the law. Lauren felt the episode was too serious of a subject to be treated properly in a cartoon, which I disagree on that one. It being a cartoon doesn't mean it can't handle heavier subject matter. The movie Zootopia dealt with a similar situation to Equal Fights, but I see the difference between the two. The Powerpuff Girls portrayed the world as perfect and equal and there were no problems, while Zootopia, we see what seems like a perfect world when actually there's problems lurking underneath it. In a forum post, Lauren Faust wrote, I have nightmares that I will be an old, old lady in my deathbed with people yelling at me for bendy and equal fights. I hope I can put them behind me someday. Lauren Faust lives in regret, but that's not all. We got another episode she hates. I can't believe the lady who helped create My Little Pony Friendship is Magic lives with so much regret. Who would have thunk it? In the Pony episode, Feeling Pinky King, the joyful pony Pinkie Pie has the ability to predict bad stuff before it happens. The more logical pony, Twilight Sparkle, feels there's a scientific explanation for her predictions. Her research proves useless when we get to the moral. I am happy to report that I now realize there are wonderful things in this world you just can't explain, but that doesn't necessarily make them any less true. It just means you have to choose to believe in them. The message was about it's okay to have some sort of faith in something we know nothing about, whether it be religious or the unknown, such as aliens. But her regret comes in some people who have interpreted this episode as anti-science. Now, are we done? Is that all for Lauren Foss's regrets? Yeah. Quest for Camelot. <sighs> she worked on that. Apparently it was originally going to be a PG-13 movie, but the studio wanted a Disney knockoff of a film for families. I don't care anymore. Next. Next. Oh man, who's gonna be number one? Hello. There he is, Johnny John K. John yells at you if you don't get it right. John, creepy around women. John, loving little girls. John, Chris Felucci. Settle down, because we got a lot of history to cover. Before getting to create his own show, John K. worked at Filmation, well known for He-Man. John hated having to draw the same few characters exactly on model with limited expression. He moved on to Deke Animation, to which he described as a company full of people with no animation knowledge. Deke's storyboard artist thought shoving a bunch of characters on screen and repeatedly changing camera angles on a TV animation budget would work out well. It didn't. This was the 80s, a terrible era where cartoons were thought up not by the artist, but by the toy executive. While I was working for all the crummy studios in LA in the 80s, doing shows that I hated and that everyone that worked on hated, 
I kept having this dream that someday I would sell something of my own, which was insane at the time. Animation wasn't done like that in the 1970s and the 1980s. They just had the weirdest way of going about deciding what to make a cartoon about. One way was a toy company would say, we're making this ugly toy here, and you have to make a cartoon series about it. Times changed in the 90s, and the channel Nickelodeon decided to do something that hasn't been done in a long time. Creator-driven cartoons, the Nicktoons, where the idea came from the artist. While regarded as classics, John has disowned multiple episodes of his Nicktoon, Ren and Stimpy. Whether it be due to his own inexperience at the time, executive meddling, censoring, or rushed production schedule, certain episodes he chose to credit himself as Raymond Spum. John's a perfectionist who will throw out work that's completed if it's not up to his code of quality. There were many times when I would come up with something and I'd say, oh, this is really good. Even John will have to admit that I did better than he would, you know, with this. And I'd bring it into him and I'd put it under him. He would just stare at it. And he would say, why didn't you do this? And with no pre-thought, he would just draw something that will one day be at the Louvre, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> this anal attitude has quite literally anally fucked John K, metaphorically speaking. For repeatedly missing deadlines, John and his whole team were fired from Ren and Stimpy, but the show continued as Games Animation Inc. took over. John felt the early episodes by Games started fine and slowly diminished in quality. After being fired, John wanted the still-employed Billy West, the voice of Stimpy, to quit in protest in hopes the network will rehire John. Billy West needed the job, so he chose not to protest. That seems disloyal, but there's this thing called capitalism. And obviously, Nick would have just replaced Billy too. The sad fact is, in the 90s, where your average viewer didn't know who made these shows, everybody was replaceable. Billy shouldn't have to give up his job because a cartoonist can't meet deadlines. TV's a business. Billy West was also a regular on the Howard Stern Show. Kicking a hornet's nest, Howard invited John Kay on as a surprise guest, so Billy and John can argue. If you want to feel totally uncomfortable for an hour, watch this one particular episode of Howard Stern. Oh, I'm a craftsman, Howard. You're a craftsman? Yeah. All right. Applying my craft. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. Doing it to the mic. What'd you say? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> John, don't you think he should he's say he's sorry apologize. a little bit? He's not allowed to apologize. Do you think he has something to apologize for? Seriously. To this day, Billy and John refuse to work with each other, and John Chris Felucci really hasn't done much notable work other than some freelance art on the side as making a Simpsons couch gag or animation for several music artists every so often. His failure to meet deadlines and being notoriously hard to work with prevents him from getting another show. Hell, he had a second chance to work on Ren and Stimpy when it was rebooted as adult party cartoon on Spike TV, and even then he faced the same conflicts, all because he was never satisfied. Lots of great cartoons came from artists who could produce great work and make a deadline. John Kay could only do half that. The cartoon's finished, Ren. Would you like to see it? Yeah, I suppose. People like John Kay's work. People don't like working with John Kay. In the professional field, everyone has to do their part on time. One person being late screws up the entire production. I know there's that looming threat that your art isn't perfect and you have to keep going back to change things. Minor things most people won't even notice. I... I can't draw! But eventually, you just have to let go. You still have the chance to make more art and keep evolving. If what you made before is horrendous, it's gonna be all the more impressive when you finally create something amazing. It's okay, Ren. Lots of people make cartoons that can't draw. Don't give up. Challenge again. The quest for the newest fruit roll-ups continues. Finally, Stimpy! It is ours! Don't you know what that means? A creation of my very own, made from my stinky sweat socks. He's gone mad! No, Ren! Yes! Yes! It's new Nickelodeon peel-outs, Ram, Stimpy, Doug, and more. Nickelodeon characters now on fruit roll-ups. What fun fruit roll-ups will we roll out with next? <laughs>